And thank you guys for coming to the presentation. My name is Vincent Hellens. Uh, I currently work at Alta Planning and Design. Uh, I am an engineer by trade, a senior engineer associate with Alta. I am the office manager for the LA office. So I am from Southern California, not Northern California, but I do have projects here. Um, about 15 years of experience uh, in the engineering side, designing uh, infrastructure projects for different municipalities throughout the states. Started my career in Alabama, uh, and then I decided to bring my talents back to California. So here I am. And with me, we have Vic Nish. We have a microphone. <laughs> Everybody, my name is Vignesh Swaminathan. Um, I'm from the Bay Area. I'm from the South, uh, South Bay, Cupertino to be specific. Um, many of you may know me as Mr. Barricade on social media. <laughs> Um, I also run uh, the business Crossroad Lab. It's a, small, it's a company I started about four or five years ago that designs uh, bicycle facilities, quick build, and civil work here in the Bay Area. All right, so we're gonna get started. And this is, again, Quick Build 101. And I lied and said that I had, that was the last question, but how many know about Quick Builds projects? All right, cool. I don't have a clicker, so you're gonna see me walk back and forth. So again, I'm just gonna start with the high level about what is Quick Build, uh, Quick Build Project. Uh, it's an interim capital improvement projects where agencies are able to get bike, head, micro mobility improvements uh, on the ground sooner rather than later. Uh, you're able to install quick builds with low cost um, materials. One thing about quick builds is you want to make sure that the material that you're using is durable and long lasting, meaning a quick build is not a demonstration project. It's not a pop up, meaning it's not a one day, one week program. It's something that's going to last for minimum six months to five years. Why do we do quick builds? Uh, they provide much needed pedestrian and bicycle improvements at a low cost. Uh, you can deliver projects on a compressed timeline. And it also accelerates the much needed AT networks throughout most agencies. Uh, and the other thing that we're gonna talk about is this project here, which is on my daily commute to downtown LA where our office is located. This quick build project is about 1.5 miles uh, of class four bike facilities that was installed during the pandemic, uh, which made my ride to work so much more comfortable than what it was. And the other thing about the quick build is that this project is now going to become a permanent project, which it just broke ground this week, Monday, where they're going to install uh, they're going to install curb medians uh, for protection, which is a reason for doing the, the quick builds because you can get the improvements on the ground sooner rather than later, with the goal of making the improvements permanent to protect the pedestrians and cyclists. For, for that. Well, this well, this is a city of LA project, and I'm, I'm not, I don't have that answer for you. Sorry. But quick builds are supposed to be cheaper to install, cheaper to design. Uh, with the the goal is looking for future funding for the permanent project. So there's a process with the quick build and you start in the planning stages, then you move into the design and then you're looking for the implementation of the project and then the maintenance side of the project. How are we gonna maintain the quick build over five years if that's the intention of the city? The goal again is to get the improvements on the ground with the plans to implement permanent improvements in the future. Let me go back. 
just two things I wanted to point out here um, is one of my favorite clients, uh, the city of Glendora in Southern California, who over the last three years have not only pushed their council uh, to get these AT improvements included in their plan, but they also were able to get them built and successfully this year. Uh, so the image on the far right is a quick build that we designed. Uh, it was a roughly half a mile of class four bike facilities. Uh, we installed, uh, it was a class four protected bike lane facility uh, that was installed for, it was originally supposed to be a pilot program for three months, but the materials that we decided to use were quick build and durable. So the agency was, was the agency wanted to keep the improvements for longer duration and it was up for six months. And now we're looking at going into the actual design phase to make this a permanent project. But it took Stephen Matier, the transportation manager, pushing his council, pushing the community to actually get the improvements built. The other one is, which is also a quick build, are parklets uh, in the city. Um, during the pandemic, they installed temporary improvements. Um, but then again, Stephen was pushing the council, pushing the community, and advocating for uh, permanent uh, parklets in their downtown village. So we went through the process, which I will share uh, in future slides, of designing the parklets and within six months they were installed. So now they have permanent parklets, eight permanent parklets in their downtown district. And the key thing about that was getting the buy-in also from the business owners as well. So advocating for the parklets and getting them installed. So the planning process. So you start with building the team. Building the team is uh, developing a, a group that's looking to really push the project forward. So that's reaching out to the, the local C CBOs, looking, reaching out to your uh, nonprofits, reaching out to the community groups, the, the TAC, building a team. Also included in that team is your council members, your elected officials, getting them involved early on on the process because why? They're going to be the ones to push for the project. They're the ones with the, they are able to reallocate funding to support your quick build project. So getting them to buy in on the project early on is important. Set, set and communicate the project goals. One thing we like to suggest is that you have a person who's going to stand alone and be the and provide all the communication to the, the community. If you have one person, they're able to really put forth the message and provide feedback to the community about why the project is so important. Uh, and then for agencies, using the existing contracts that you may have to get the, the projects uh, designed and implemented as quickly as you can. So if there is a, a need, I mean, if there's a lack of, of staff support on the agency side, using your on-call contracts to establish uh, and be able to get a, a team to support you to design the quick build project. The last one is to the, the advocate for more funding for the quick bill. Uh, as I mentioned, getting your elected officials involved early on is the most important thing to getting these quick bill projects pushed out and then also getting them, in, getting them turned into permanent projects. Design process. So similar to a permanent project, you have to design them according to the standards. There are guidelines that are out there. They have to meet ADA and PROAG requirements. Um, so the thing I want to point out is that when we're working on the quick build designs, we're making sure that they meet the standards uh, for each agency. Specifically, if it's a Caltrans um, state highway, 
way, you have to go through their process, which it's a little bit more rigorous than um, a local agency, but you may have to apply for an encroachment permit to actually get the project implemented. You have to, if the, if the project doesn't, if the, if the project doesn't meet the highway design manual, then you're going to have to include a design decision exceptions for the project. Why, why is the project important or things that Caltrans are, are going to want to know? So just making sure that you're, you're following the, the local agency guidelines and the MUTCD uh, to make sure you implement the quick build project appropriately. Continuing on with the design. Uh, so when we're looking at the design, so this is the, the Glendora parklets when we were looking at installing the eight parklets throughout their village. We went out to the field, we assessed the site. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we weren't uh, doing any reconstruction. You wanna avoid reconstruction with your quick build projects. The goal is to provide safety improvements between the existing infrastructure curb to curb. So you don't want to impact drainage and you want to make sure that you provide detailed design plans and then also traffic control plans are going to be needed to install the project. The detailed design plans are important because when you're out installing the, the project, and if you have a contractor that's actually installing the project, it's gonna make the, the implementation side of things a bit easier when they're out there in the field. That was the lessons learned that I'm gonna share on the next slide, that we learned when we put the plans together, uh, we left out uh, dimensions that were needed for, um, for the, the implementation side of things. This is the design plans that we shared with the city for the implementation of the quick build. Uh, this was the class four bike facility. So it's, it's hard to see, but there's a lot of detail here. There's a lot of uh, how, ma how many linear feet is needed of, of paint in order to get this uh, facility installed how many bollards are needed to install the, the curb extensions that were implemented on this project. Um, so we went through uh, a process of going through and detailing out the design and making sure that it met all of the CAMUTCD guidelines. Moving on to the implementation side of things, who's going to implement the project uh, for the quick build? Um, most agencies try to implement it with their local public work staff and the operation and maintenance group. That's a, 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 an alternative to using a contractor and it's a cost effective way of getting these, these improvements on the ground sooner. So these two images are us installing the, uh, the parklets. And when I say us, because it was the local CBOs, it was the uh, cons Conservation Corp, and it was the staff installing the parklets. Again, this is the class four bike facility and curb extensions that were installed uh, on Glendora Avenue. And again, the installation was, was completed by the, the agency staff uh, and the local CBO. Here's another image of the curb extension from an aerial view, but uh, again, the project was designed, I mean, implemented by local agency staff. And then I'm gonna turn it over now to Vic Nish to discuss more of the materials and details of the quick build projects. Sure. <laughs> Just had a quick question. You started out with saying quick builds are supposed to be permanent, um, and yet there seems to be, well, at least in my um, city, quick builds are thought to be temporary and supposed to be torn out after a few months. Um, what's the disconnect or bridge there? So, so they are meant to be permanent in the sense that the material needs to be durable to last up to five years. The projects are temporary with the intent to become a permanent project. 
And quick builds, they do have, they, they do afford you the opportunity to make modifications and that's the, the purpose of the quick build. So if, if a, a, a curb extension is, isn't working effectively the way it was designed, you're able to adjust it in real time and make, the, and make those, those adjustments for the permanent project. So eventually, once the project it's, gets through the, the three year, I mean, the three months or six months, the goal is to have it implemented as a permanent project. Yeah. And I think I'll also add that, that a lot of times we do pilot projects that are out there for a few months to observe data, to convince internal staff of the need of these kind of projects. And internally, if many of you guys work at agencies, I'm sure you get arguments with your own staff members about like what is the right thing to do. And for a lot of very, very technical engineers that are just by the book that are scared to innovate, they need to see the data, they need to see the observation of how that facility is being used, both from maintenance and from the user perspective. Questions? So, um, quick build, I think what, what quick build is, I think is specifically for material that's gonna be out there for a long time. A pop-up can be from maybe even CBOs bring out their own planters, maybe they glue reflective tape to their own planters or hay bales or other types of like, maybe there's some local cultural uh, amenities or artifacts or art that needs to be out there temporarily and that can be out there and there's not really a maintenance and operations plan to go and re-implement and re-put down the post. In a quick build project, a lot of times the cities will purchase extra posts to kind of keep in stock so when they and they know how they work so they can go out there and, and re-implement them when they get hit. Um, I, would, I would say like longer than a week. Anything that's longer than a week is quick build or should be quick build. <laughs> so for a data system maker question for a cash trapped city municipality, why aren't why, why, why wouldn't you just put the whole crowd today? It's going to last five years anyways, and nothing is pretty horrible. You're right. Let's do a quick build. <laughs> Let's do a quick build. And for a city that's cash strapped, so they were to do uh, like CIP level, like design bid build projects, they're going to put all their investment into like two curb extensions, and everybody's going to want a piece of it. The, the sustainable folks are going to want to swale. The fire truck is going to want their right turn. Like everybody's going to want a piece of that project. And so you're going to put all your money into that one project, and it might even fail. So doing a quick build project is a really, really smart way of delivering things for small cities. But I would, I would also add, you know, the material that you're going to, the, main, the maintenance side of things, when you put something permanent in the ground, it's less maintenance, right? You put the concrete on the ground, you're not going to have to maintain it every five years. So I think that would be the difference for, you know, a quick build project versus a permanent project, because you want something that's going to be there permanent, and you, you're, you're going to want to spend less money maintaining that infrastructure that you've put out there. 100%, curbs last. So my name is Vignesh Swaminathan. Um, I, I started Crossroad Lab four or five years ago. Before that, I was a heavy highway engineer doing freeway interchanges, um, grading and drainage for freeway interchanges. And I kind of grew designing bicycle pedestrian facilities across freeway interchanges and working with Caltrans on getting bike paths and uh, sidewalks across freeway interchanges. Before that, I worked as a parking engineer. I was super excited about parking, which not many people are, and uh, parking and traffic control. And so I, in the, for the city of San Jose, I managed the downtown for events, festivals, and marathons. I, I shut down the streets for like a, from the rock and roll festival to when Obama came to town and, and then to like a block party. And that's when I really saw the amount of change you could have in a street from a few hours when it was a busy roadway to suddenly people are partying and even drinking in the middle of the street. And uh, um, a few years ago, I was doing a lot of these pilot projects where we would go out there and bring community-based organizations and teach them about what we're doing and, 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 and do a lot of on the street work. And then that kind of died in the pandemic. So then I decided to go onto social media and I started posting POV videos of how these facilities work and how we're supposed to use them. And I grew on social media accidentally. I didn't really, wasn't really a social media person before this, but now I have 1.5 million followers on TikTok. It's a little outdated um, with over 1.2 billion views on, on, on TikTok of people who have seen my face and knowing that I, I talk about bike lanes. So, <laughs> um, and other than that, I have, I sit a few, I sit on a few uh, commission roles. I'm the chair of the Valley Transportation Agency's advisory committee and I'm also the chair of Cupertino's Sustainability Commission. So kind of, I, I see this from many different angles.
Um, one of the main things that we do is why are we quick building is because we, we, we want to change the streets. There's sustainability groups that want to do more swales and more infrastructure. And at the end of the day, we have impervious area, which is our pavement. And so we're all water-based. Our system's always been water-based. And we've always been manipulating water for our needs. From the history of time, we've always been doing it. And we're still doing it that today. And I want to get hit home that quick build is still just working towards modification of the roadway, modification of drainage, modification of how water goes into the inlets. It's still, we're still doing that. We've gone through many, many phases in our in our country of of, of going from uh, if we were Native Americans would would live amongst the river, and as the river meanders, they would move their lives and move their move their uh, uh, their homeland as as nature messed with with the environment, as nature did what nature does. And through our through our through our history, we've gone from an agricultural society, and we've gone through suburbia, and then highways have come through and cut through neighborhoods. And every single time, we're modifying drainage. Um, on the top left, I'd like to point out this is a typical roadway section where we call something called a clear zone and that's what's supposed to be for a car if the car loses control they end up in a ditch or they make sure we don't put hard infrastructure right next to them and that's called a clear zone um, and it took only it took uh, mothers from drunk for drunk driving to kind of fight for curbs even you know but that was a big deal putting a curb in a street of something that somebody's going to hit and now we're talking about posts and other stuff that people are going to hit but it's been a lot of history of what are we going to put in the roadway and how it's going to mess with with drainage over the many years and now we have a lot of best practices that we try to push in the long run, you know, such as we want to put in more bioswales and neck down to the road and, 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 and move curbs. We want to put uh, um, wildlife corridors where there's pollinating plants and tre uh, trees where bees can and butterflies can work their ways from the hills to the waterfront. We want to create creature, um, um, creek uh, trails where rodents can do the same thing. We want to work on um, historical flooding situations. So right here is the area where I'm, I'm from. I used to live in, I lived in East Palo Alto for a few years. And he, for those of you guys who don't know, East Palo Alto is a very different community than Palo Alto. There's Palo Alto and there's East Palo Alto. And the main difference is East Palo Alto is a flood zone. Okay, And so there's Palo Alto and there's a huge flood zone that goes around all of East Palo Alto. And historically, there's been disinvestment, not a lot of money, miscommunication about the environmental issues. And the poor community there that's a very much, much a minority, low-income communities, is kind of sidelined in terms of funding uh, in the area. Um, there's also a county border between the two. So one's in San Mateo County and one's in Santa Clara County, which people don't really know between East, and East Palo Alto and, and Palo Alto. Um, what you'll see here is a lot of street trees uh, on one side, and that's Atherton, which is the most expensive zip code in America. Uh, and, and across the one freeway interchange is East Palo Alto, which was murder capital of the country in the 90s. So there's a stark difference when we, when we, when we, do, when we do quick build in different communities, and we need to atone that when we work with different communities. Some communities will, may want different types of quick build, and it takes a lot of listening when we, when we do these kind of projects. So some of the things that we do, not only do we want to teach people about drainage and move curb extensions and reallocate space for drainage, but we also try to work on safety. And so one of the things that I talk about a lot is protected intersection or curb extensions and other types of ways of slowing down traffic um, because of the speed differential. And this is a kind of a newer concept. You might think like, hey, we've always had feet. We've always had cars. There's a big difference between the speed. But no, we're only, we're only thinking about that more now than we did over many, many years. Right here, you have weaving, which is a very normal thing in traffic engineering where vehicles or other modes go, move up to the same speed and they weave to merge. But we can't expect cyclists to do that, or at least we used to for some reason. Um, we, we expected cyclists to be able to ride with traffic, share with traffic all the time at whatever speeds. Just to go through on a street, you have to do this weaving movement every time. And so that's very, very difficult for uh, um, users, and it really discourages a lot of different types of, types of use users. Uh, it, people who uh, um, maybe don't have a $2,000 bike and Lycra and electric, they're not they're not really for everybody else who's writing for utility you're writing for necessity you're writing with friends this is not really the, a great way of uh, of, cr of, of crossing and we have some best practices we're not we're, not, we're working on it you know NACTO for many years has been pushing the limit of design and many of you guys have seen NACTO guidelines and here's some screenshots of the best practices that we have up until now so we have standards we have MUTCD we have how we can read the MUTCD how we can argue I'll talk about a few ways that I've argued for certain things in MUTCD, for such as uh, painted crosswalks and uh, curb extensions, and um, but we still have to follow certain standards. Um, right, right, what you'll see is right here is this is 
what Caltrans recommends, which is bicycle left turn pockets next to left turns, which is kind of ridiculous to me. I, I, I don't know why we expect a cyclist to weave over multiple lanes to get next to a left turn pocket, but that's what the Caltrans standard tells us to do. Um, what we're really trying to do is trying to push cyclists to encourage more types of cyclists to cross in two stages, to cross more like a pedestrian, because they're not riding as fast as the vehicles, and they're riding much slower than pedestrians, or at least the type of cyclists that we're trying to encourage to ride in these facilities. Our riding and so crossing in two stages can be facilitated by many ways, such as a bike box or a curb extension or some sort of protection where they can go and cross in two stages, similar to how a pedestrian crosses. And I, I'd say a lot of our quick build projects are to help facilitate that type of movement. Because we've learned that having people to be protected, having people to have a place to wait and engage with traffic, having there be eye contact between the driver and the cyclist is super important. It makes people recognize that they're actually humans on this street and not just baby on board signs in the back of a, a car. And it's, it's, it's really, really important to make eye contact. And that's what's a big thing about uh, uh, necking down the la lanes, tighten the radius to make sure that the vehicle comes at turns and faces a, a pedestrian or a cyclist. And so one of the big things that I talk about is a, a protected intersection. Alta put it together a great guide many years ago called the evolution of the protected intersection. And many other people have been putting out guidelines. I myself have worked on a guideline with NACTO called don't give up at the intersection because engineers like to give up at the intersection because they rather leave the liability onto the user with a dashed line than put, put it on their license. And so it's, it's a big issue in our industry of, 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 of how comfortable are you with doing certain standards and messing with the standards. And uh, um, one of the big things of the, of a protected intersection is you have a place to wait for crossing two stages, but you also accommodate for large trucks, which is a big deal in, in quick build. I see too many consultants starting off their early concepts with smaller trucks, and then they get to final quick build and the projects get run over. And they're wondering, why did we get run over? Oh, it's because you didn't design for a bus. We should have designed for a bus. We love transit. Why are we designing for a SU30 or a smaller vehicle when we know a bus is gonna come there and the project will fail if we don't plan accordingly? So there's ways to a, a, a plan for larger vehicles, even with a tight radius. And one of the best ways to do that is you step back and left turn stop bar up the side street. So you can still have a tight radius, but you set back the left turn stop bar. And anybody who, who, who's friends with truckers knows that truckers are truck whisperers and they can be able to oversteer and turn. And if they were to do with this a smooth turn in auto turn, we're talking about 10 miles per hour, which is pretty fast. I can still kill somebody. But if we do an oversteer, it forces them to bulb out a little bit. It comes down the speed to a five, three miles per hour and the fatality rate goes down significantly. Yeah. Can you hear that again, sir? Um, what? Can you, can you say that again slower? Sure. What, what are you installing? Yeah, so right here, when a vehicle turns around this corner, you see this blue shape right here? The, it, we set back this left turn for the side street so that the truck can make that turn. The trucks make a wide turn and that way they, they go around the protection. If we don't plan for that left turn and we don't push that back, the truck is not gonna be able to fit it and they're gonna run over your project. <laughs> So if you give them that space, truckers know how to navigate small streets. The street wasn't small before, it's small now. So they've been around small streets, so they know how to navigate this. So this is something very normal to most, most uh, truckers. Um, and, and, and so setting back the left turn stop bar, you'll see that on these one-way streets and two-way streets, but it's really, really important. Um, when we, we, we might just think tightening the radius is the right thing to do, but there's more to it, and we have to plan for all modes. If you don't plan for all modes, including the trucks, your project will fail. There's a lot of people in the city, city engineers, who the main thing that they grew up in value is trucks. That's how I was trained as an engineer, was trucks is the main thing that we have to plan for. So we can still plan for protective facilities with that. So we have the so we had a fatality recently in a local city where a truck was stopped at um, this and didn't see, um, it was in a blind spot, the pedestrian bicyclist got in front of them and they ran them over and killed them. Is there any uh, design in the protected intersection that can help prevent that kind of occurrence where these trucks have monstrous blind spots and they can't see what's right in front of them? Yes, I didn't, I didn't mention that, but this type of oversteering eliminates that blind spot. So if the truck were to not oversteer, there's a huge blind spot. I don't know if you guys have seen, there's a famous video on YouTube of how many cyclists can fit in the blind spot of a truck. That's because a truck is just turning straight. But if they were to oversteer, there's, we, do, we, do, we do a side oversteer and exit oversteer, so they actually go out and go around. And that way they come and they have eye contact and they come and they cross more perpendicularly. Perpendicular crossing is much more important than leaving. 
this was a slightly different situation. This was actually, they were stopped at a uh, stoplight. They were uh, looking for a red light. They're looking for traffic to the, their left. And someone actually was right in front of their truck. You just move the stop line way back so that they can't, they can see what's in front of them. Cause they actually literally pulled into the, the crosswalk and killed the person. So those, but they're also in a right turn. So right here, Mm -hmm. So what, what what happened here is there was a, probably a bike lane, and the cyclist went and got in front of the. Okay, so they're right in front of the, the truck, and it's below the hood of the truck, right? So what this does, the person who's crossing, was they crossing this street or what? Across the, the movement, not with the movement. They're coming this way, and they got run over straight. Yes. There, there's a couple strategies that the protecting intersection does not solve that. Head-on collisions of somebody right in front of you, the truck hood, the protecting intersection can slow down by narrowing down the lane, but if they're already at a stop, there's the, well, one of the things that we can do with protecting intersection is raising the actual intersection or raising crosswalks so they become more aware of some sort of vertical feedback that comes up. Stop line back to the, when they come off the crosswalk. Yeah, you can pull the stop line, stop the, the, the through stop line back as well. There's not much wrong with that, with, with doing that as well. And you can create some space in front to kind of give a little bit of a buffer there. But if somebody's not paying attention and there's somebody below the hood of the, the truck, it's very difficult for children or smaller. The hood of the truck is very, very high. And so um, I'd say doing some sort of raised features or some sort of bumps on the crosswalk or something that gives some sort of vertical element, because you have so many things we can use to slow down vehicles, horizontal deflection and vertical deflection. So we can move them side to side and neck things down or we can move them up and down right signs don't work i'm telling you you put up a sign people don't look at signs you know um we drive fast a lot of cities engineers love signs because it takes away the liability you put up a white sign saying that these are the rules you put up a warning sign and it's saying like i put up a sign but i think that type of engineering is flawed i think it's just not the right way we should be doing approaching people and uh, um so protected intersections help a lot help a lot and you can do stuff i i've been working on a few projects where at every single drive we be putting a, a speed bump in front of every single driveway. We can put speed bumps in front of crosswalks. So there's ways of doing quick build with different types of materials to help give that kind of feedback. But at the end of the day, it's about planning for all types of feedback. So what I'd recommend there is maybe putting some vertical speed bumps on either side of that crosswalk if it was in a quick build kind of project. And that way they would feel that when they go over. And some engineers might atone to that to be like, oh no, you're putting it in the through movement. But if it's a heavy downtown and people aren't supposed to be going that fast anyway, then I think there's certain times that you can prioritize that. Um, but there's a lot of flexibility in these type of designs, and it's important for engineers to kind of over-design and under-design. One more question, one more. If you, if you go back to that intersection, so when it's, it helps the left turn to put the stop sign further down, but most of the time, if they are not signaled, the intersection pulling that back would hindrance the visibility. If you are a biker or like even cars, it's good for the buses and track to have that radius. That I see a lot even around here. You can now see there is a truck car, a, a car parked there, a truck there, or a building even. So how do you deal with that? That is one of the conflict areas in their intersection, even pulling it further back is uh, put them people dangerous in there. Yeah, when you sight line is 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 very important for through movements. And so pushing back the stop around for the through can be a difficult conversation. For the left turn, they may already be slowed down and they're already focused on one movement. But sight lines is how we learned as engineers of what to prioritize. Um, a lot of times, the, in a lot of guidelines, honestly, there isn't, here's the thing that nowhere in any guideline, even the most innovative guidelines that anybody talked about how to deal with protection and there's protected bike lanes and stop signs. That's not there. I'm working on so many of those and every time it's different because if there isn't any good direction on that in any of the guidelines from any consultant or any city about how to deal with protected intersections and stop signs um, when there's no signal. Um, we, we've dealt with it in a few different ways by kind of accommodating for both types of cyclists, cyclists that want to mix with traffic and cyclists that want to be protected. And so we plan for both in the projects I work on. So we have a protected area for people who want to and a mixed area for bikes to get in front but it's, it's a, it's a, this is a difficult thing to deal with. But yes, you have to balance in the sidelines and you have to balance the truck turns and you have to balance the, uh, the grading and the ADA. And a lot of times the projects that I'm working on, we don't have room for these refuges. So we actually tell the bikes to yield to the pedestrian zone and they have this big colored art in the zone and tell the
the bike to be, act like a pedestrian. So there's, they, it comes in different forms, but the main things to prioritize is the stop bar location and the, uh, the turning in these type of intersections. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, I'll take one more question and then I'll move on to the next uh, next slide and maybe. Uh, uh, yes, I had a question about the, um, you know, did, having uh, two ramps would help you if in the situation you just described. Um, you know, a lot of times they just put a single ramp in the middle. So then going up it's into the refuge and then you have to sort of backtrack. It's, it's hard to, to sort of get back around. Um, so uh, I guess that sounds like a, an argument to have um, um, double ramps instead of a single ramp. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was my comment. Yeah, they, these ones are typically we try to put single double ramps in most situations. I'll take one more, one last question. Uh, you can keep going. Okay. Cool. Um, so we have a, a bunch of different guidelines about how to do these type of intersections, but reality in California, all we really have is this diagram on the left here. This is DIB 89. It's a Caltrans amendment to the highway design manual that tells you that you can do protected bike lanes. Along with this, I didn't show it because it's kind of embarrassing. It's a picture of a protected intersection that looks like it's made in Microsoft Word. And that's all we have as engineers of how to plan out, plan out the, these infrastructure. But this basically tells you what is a, a, what type of separation is. It's DIB 89. It's a good read. I think everybody should get familiar with that type of that document. It's a few pages. Um, we have documents that have come out from the Fed, federal government, uh, separated bike guide. And this is probably one of the most robust documents that I've seen. Um, it's from Massachusetts. Uh, it came out in 2015. I think Massachusetts only successfully delivered a very few, like a handful of intersections with this guideline over the last five, six, seven years. But um, this, has, this has the most amount of material in there about what a protected intersection is. Um, we took a lot of that information and I, I studied it to death and we helped develop the don't give up at the intersection guidance, which I think is very, very thorough. I recommend all cities take, take that in. What I made sure to happen in the don't give up in the intersection book is to actually have details, engineering details that engineers and city staff can adopt. Because there's too many times that cities get hired to do a bikeway design guideline by some consultant and it's just pictures of Seattle and other cities without actually an engineering stamp detail that is planned and can be approved very, very easily. And and looking at pictures of different cities and other stuff is not as important as actually knowing what can fit in, in your city. And so this document has that, but for a lot of cities, city staff, getting to the point of understanding what that detail is, is so important. When I work with my cities, I've learned that I talk to each person very, very differently. When I talk with my engineers, I don't tell them about bicycle facilities. I come with a detail in their CAD lines, with their numbering, because they're used to that. They haven't seen different CAD styles ever, you know? And so they're just used to looking at it in a certain way. So you have to communicate with everybody on a different level when you work with uh, different folks. Um, we, we worked on this really great pilot project in uh, Mountain View. This was a few months, this was, this was a few weeks. This, the city engineers were very scared about putting in protected bike lanes in, in Mountain View on this project. This was done with the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. Um, this was on California Ave. So this project has a long history. I worked on the original planning study for California Ave many years ago at my previous firm. Um, and then went to this first phase and then suddenly they backtracked and they said that we're scared to take away a lane even for a week, right? And they said, we have to just observe how people are gonna use the facility. And so there's just a lot of fears. And when you have those fears, that's when you end up with pilot projects. But it really takes about communicating to each person individually. Um, this is very different from how we typically do projects. And so for everybody who's advocating in their own city, you really have an uphill battle because your city engineers are so used to design, bid, build, and everybody's pointing at fingers at each other every step of the way. And quick build is different than that. What I mean by design, bid, build is you have your, do your design, your Cadillac design in the best way you want. Your city engineers bid it out, but they also value engineer it and cut out stuff and then they bid it out. And then you have a construction, uh, somebody who's hired after that to go deliver that project. Uh, and um, there's not really any ownership over the project. And Quick Build is all about ownership by the city. Um, so this is the, the process of kind of helping politically move things along. You do start doing these pilot demonstration projects with CBOs and, and art and different material, materials that are, are donated. This project we did in front of City Hall. Um, it was a wrong way protected bike lane in front of the City Hall parking garage so all the city staff could turn across it. Because they didn't believe that it would work. And so we took away a lane in front of their daily commute and made a bikeway go the opposite direction and showed that it was going to work perfectly fine. That way all the politicians and engineers could be like, yes, 
I turned left across it. Everything's fine, right? But they had never seen that before, you know? And so this was really, really important to pick the right location. We actually never even built this side in the long run because they wanted to wait for a developer to come through and build it. But we used this project to build 16 miles all around the downtown. The public infrastructure, do you use uh, traffic tape or actual tape? And it depends on the material of materials. Uh, traffic tape works well. 3M has many, many products that work well that you can move and flex and stick on different things. Um, I really am a fan of the 3M products. Um, but it, you, you can work in different ways. I say with regular paint, it may not be seen as well as a, as a 3M material. Um, and 3M material can be reused again. Um, but the pilot projects can happen in different ways. What's really important is how is it gonna be implemented? Um, um, we talked a little bit about traffic control, but traffic control can be more costly than your quick build project. Even, you know, what happened with the Mountain View project is we were going to work with volunteers, we were going to have uh, Bicycle Coalition work with it. I have insurance to have volunteers out in the street, but there was sudden uh, resistance from the city and they want us to hire an actual traffic control provider. So we had to scale down the project and teach a traffic control provider how to build a bike lane. And it got, it got, it got really hairy. Um, and it just really, really costs a lot uh, to, to hire those folks. What happened here is the city with their own insurance and their own staff brought the their own staff out there to go bring out their own materials. And you have to do it that cost effective way. Um, it depends on who's gonna build it and how you get insurance to have people out on the street and how comfortable your city attorney is on approving that. So it really varies city by city and you can have very conservative city uh, attorneys that just don't want anybody in the street unless it's a traffic control trained person who's done everything, even if, the, even if there's even staff monitoring that. So it varies quite a bit. If you do it the other way, then you end up with this design bid build format and it gets to a very, very costly project. And those projects will get Frankenstein or cut up into different pieces and phased and it, 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 it can change quite a bit. Um, and then they, they can lead to actual permanent installations like this one in Cupertino where we put down a curb down the whole way in Cupertino or this one in Fremont where we, uh, I'll talk about this later, but we purchased some electrical units that were very, very unique for quick build and I'll talk about that later. And so the main the, the main goal of, of it is to uh, is to try and help uh, the, the crossing interaction safer, better, and more visible. This is a, a screenshot of the "Don't Give Up at the Intersection" guide that I've talked about a few times. But this has the details of explaining what everything should be, with what the, what radius things could be, what what distance, and how it varies. Just the stuff that engineers love to read through. And so I recommend checking out that guidance and uh, sharing it with, with folks. Um, one of the things that I do is I make TikToks to talk to people about this. So I'm going to play one of my TikToks. Hopefully this works. Um, uh, it's until we have sound. Well, basically, um, I'll just play it and I'll point out to you what you, I'll explain what I'm saying, but I'm like, hey y'all, Mr. Barricade here. I'm, not, I'm at an intersection in San Jose. <laughs> um, this is a particular intersection that I designed. Let's check it out. And then I, I st 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 the, this stop bar for the vehicles is right back here and the bicycles wait all the way over there. So you can stay, they can be well seen by any vehicles that approach, approach them. Um, and, and, and that way the, 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 the blind spot is taken away and they also get to go ahead before actual vehicles and so you're able to get through the intersection before a vehicle even crosses their path. Um, there's, we put a tight radius so they come around and they can turn perpendicularly and they can actually look back at the actual uh, uh, Bike, bicycle facility. And when they cross, they come all the way up to the second box and they wait before they cross uh, a second time. And uh, um, it helps facilitate this movement and helps them be seen. It's very well be seen, much, very much seen at night. And to be honest, on most of the projects that I work on with actual curbs, we end up putting posts on top of the curbs anyway because people are hitting the curves. Because people have, didn't have a quick build phase first. If they had a quick build phase first, where they got used to post, got used to traffic control, saw it, and then it became concrete, they might have been more used to it because they know when they get on that street, it looks a certain way. But we end up putting posts on it all, all the time first because they, they get some love, some black scuffs on the, on the curbs. And, and it's, in my, my opinion, quick build works great, in, even in long-term projects. So here's an example of a quick little detail, just for San Jose. You can see the amount of level detail for one intersection. We built 58 corners in the downtown. Um, 16 full protected intersections, over 18 miles of corridors throughout the downtown San Jose. This happened, this project was a great project. It was sponsored by the Knight Foundation to kind of help rush things really, really fast. Um, this project uh, um, was built uh, right when the scooters came out. And San Jose is the only city in, in the country that did not ban the scooters as soon as they came out. They came out and they were like, yo, we, 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 I think 
we can work with this. And so we quickly built the project. And then by the time three, four companies came out, the project was done. And we were, we, we, it became Scooter City. This eventually leads to fully built out, raised protected intersection. So here's a civil plan of a fully raised protected intersection in Fremont. Fremont has been rated the happiest city to live in in the country. It's also the, one of the safest cities in the country where it had uh, the, mo the significant decrease in fatalities and crashes throughout their entire town during the pandemic. It's the only city that had that during the pandemic. And it's because they've been putting huge raised protected bike lane facilities, started with quick build, eventually led to fully built out ones in the suburbs. In, not in the urban area. They just built it there because Fremont, for anybody who's from the Bay Area, it's the Bay Area's cut through. You know, Everybody gets off the freeway of 880, 680 and cuts through Fremont streets and then gets back onto the freeway. And the Fremont city was against that. The strategy that Fremont used, and everybody take notes on this, is they, they, didn't, they needed to figure out how to reduce the speed. So through pavement maintenance, they put in quick build bike lanes and reduce all the lanes to 10 and 11 feet. Then they did their traffic study and they observed the 85th percentile speed. And they showed that, hey, everybody's slowing down now. Wonder why? Let's lower the speed, you know? And so then they lowered the speed and they came and then they built up fully raised protected intersections. So that's how they were able to lower the speed secretly of their entire town by through maintenance, they've narrowed the lanes down, still keeping everything open. Didn't sometimes design the intersection, sometimes didn't. And then they did the traffic study. But too many, honestly, scrub traffic engineers just do their uh, study, right? And then they'd be like, oh, we have to take away the crosswalk because everybody's speeding. What? You know, I, I, they, they, but no, I'm serious. I have friends who, who, are, I, who are like this, traffic engineer for the whole city, and they'd be like, Vignesh, I have to take away the crosswalk. I did the study. I'm like, why are you doing the study when your lanes are 14, 15 feet wide? Of course people are speeding, right? And so there, there's a, there's a, there's a um, what, do, what is our long-term goals here? And Fremont, I'd say, is a great city who has done this well, done quick build to eventually lead to fully built intersections. It's a great case, case study for people to look at. So, like I said earlier, we go from design, bid, build, which is 100% owned by the contractor and the consultants. The consultants take the city for the ride. The contractors take the city for the ride. 100% no ownership by the city because you do your design at full 100%. The city engineers value, value engineered, and then it goes to a contractor. And this is how we deserve projects in the city government. Um, do, do, one of the ways that building owners deliver projects is design build, where they want to know everything, operations, maintenance, I own this building, the same architect needs to tell me how, what, how, how I need to replace the windows when they break, and it's full ownership over the building. Um, and that's called design build. It's a different type of project delivery. What we're really trying to get at is integrated project delivery, where the city staff is enabled to actually go implement this stuff themselves. And it's an ongoing process, because what, what, what you don't want is you don't want to have a consultant who's just the one who's a bridge between the community and the city. You want the city to be the, that connection so they can have continuous feedback. If there's a change, if there's a crash, if there's an issue, the city can respond. They don't, they're not strapped by a consultant in between. And that's what we're trying to get to. But it's really hard to unlearn this and eventually get to that. It's not easy for a lot of cities because they're so used to their way. Their entire policies, every department is designed, bid, build. You can some ways of doing that through augmented staff, some ways of doing that through um, um, enabling the city. But really, if you have one person who's really, really like pushing it in the city, you can get integrated project delivery where you, the city maintenance crew knows how to implement stuff. Everybody, everybody's working together. Um, the best way that I know to communicate engineering is we talk about it in plan, specs, and estimate. But these are really fancy words for an exhibit memo and cost. So if you have a, if you have a, even an exhibit, you have a little bit of a write-up of what's going to be impacted. You have a cost associated with that. You can move mountains. Okay, I sit on a few different commissions. If I have an exhibit memo cost in my in front of me in those five minutes that I have to make a decision in front of a Zoom meeting, I can make a decision. But if I just say, hey, this is bike lanes, this is what we need to do. I can't make a decision, right? And so for your city council and stuff that, if they have that information in front of them, at those times they have that meeting, it's really bite-sized for them to just go and make a decision. And so what we want, what we, what we want, what we have is we have community leaders that try to push city staff to do significant project. What we really need is city staff enabling community leaders to have ongoing project delivery. So we need the city staff to educate, teach, enable uh, CBOs, minority CBOs, cultural CBOs, advocacy groups, you know, to be able to go and communicate what their needs are to have ongoing project delivery. It may be bike lanes, it may be art, it may be parklets, maybe all kinds of stuff. Oh, my way. <laughs>
Patrick, you, you, you're mentioning uh, city staff, and I think this is a, a key element. To, to get a project running, we need leadership, city staff willing to do it, and money. What do you do when your city staff is back, you know, has been trained in the 80s, has an old mindset, and for them, the, the best route is to have a median in the middle with a tree. And, when, and no, of, of course, no back lane and no protection whatsoever. How do you fight the deeply in, uh, rooted car-centric vision? Thank you. It's a, it's a lot of work. And I'd say you start off with getting them to come to meetings and conferences like this, getting them to travel out Outside of their outside of their city, um, for what, what for a lot of city staff, their engineer learned from their supervisor who spent 40 years in that city until retirement, right? And they learned from another city staff who spent 40 years in that city until retirement. And so that, that knowledge is very incestual, and it hasn't really learned more beyond the boundary of the city. And until you go to see videos, or you go to other conferences, and you see how other cities are working, then the, the, the things start churning. But for a young engineer, they learned everything from the city of whatever the standard details, and that's what they're used to. And that's what they built their entire career off of. So to go in them and tell them, hey, do something new with green bike lanes or do something new with posts is a little scary for them, right? So because that's their entire career in reality. You know, we may go travel in other ways and bike around, but they've never jumped on a bike and they've only driven into work and they've only done road car centric facilities. There's a lot of theory behind there's a lot of theory behind medians and stuff like that, but you can start to argue the same theory onto protected bike lanes. So one of the theory behind medians is when you drive, you have trees and you can see the trees go past you. And and you feel like you're going fast because the trees are going by you fast, right? So you can do the same thing with posts and you can argue the posts are going by you fast and you see that. So there's ways of leveling with them to argue the same principles that they find value in different facilities. Narrowing the lane with a median next to the left could be the same as narrowing down with something next to the right of them, right? And so talking to them on their level is really, really key because you, I've been to cities where there's just some, there's some key staff member that's just so disengaged from it and there's everybody in the city is waiting until that staff member retires until they can actually move forward with projects, you know? And there's, I'm sure many of you can think about that traffic engineer or person who's, who's like that. And, um, and it just takes, you can level with them and get them convinced or you just wait it out. But I think you can, I think you can level with them and get them convinced by explaining theory and bring them to conferences. And a lot of them are excited to learn from other folks who are working in this space. And so I think these kind of events are really, really critical. All right, we got two more. This is just a tag on what you're saying is, I haven't tried this with engineers yet, but I've done it with um, city council members, supervisors, and other city staff is take them out with me on a bike. Take them for a bike ride yeah. on the area so that they actually see what we see because most of the time the people making decisions about this stuff from whatever level don't ride so they don't even know what, it, what it's like from our experience. And I've had some, some really good success with that. This has been very good, and, and I hope it encourages more of us to get uh, quick builds in place. But I have a criticism, and it may sound like a small one, uh, but it's important to us who uh, helped with the legislation which created Class 4 bikeways. In California, there is a requirement to use bike lanes. Uh, when you refer to a class four separated bikeway as a protected bike lane, you are misrepresenting that facility and I wish you would change that. We want to preserve the choice to be able to use the class four facility or the open roadway and to the extent people get confused and think the class four is a bike lane, that reduces that choice. Mm -hmm. So if you will, consider changing that. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. And to, clear, to explain what, the, what, the, what the, the point the point we're trying to make is, you know, the difference between the designation of way or lane. So a way means that you have the option of using that if you don't want to. And a lane means that's your space and you're supposed to be there. And so we refer to these things as protected bike lanes. It kind of tells the car driver and legally that if a bike is not in that, they're at fault. And if you put it as a protected bike way, then people who do ride fast or do need to get out of the protected bike lane because there's debris or trash, or maybe it's just easier to make a left because the facility is not designed properly, or maybe they're, they're, maybe they're on an e-bike and actually going with traffic, right? And they're going as fast as traffic. Designating as protected bike way is, is a proper way of, of calling these facilities. There's too many times in standards we call them protected bike lanes, um, but that's because we're, we're, we're trying to do a lane, but you're, you're correct. A separated bike way or the word way is, is critical 
vehicle for the legal perspective. And we work on a few facilities where there's a high e-bike usage. And so we're actually talking about even implementing a secondary shoulder on the inside so that they can just, it's like a three foot thing, but they, they can kind of wave, wiggle around that to go around traffic and even a forward bike box for those folks who do ride with traffic that way. Because there are a lot of folks who just, who ride fast, uh, folks who do a lot of bike tour and just be like, I'm never gonna be in that facility. It's a dangerous facility because I have to look down more than look forward. And uh, um, I, I totally understand that, uh, that, that, that perspective. So two questions about bikeways. Um, first, how do we get them cleaned more regularly? And also, people really like to be side by side when, and they also be able to pass because otherwise, single file, I'd wish all car drivers had to, you know, they didn't, you couldn't have passengers side by side. Sorry, everyone has to be front to back in the side of their cars and be really narrow like a bike so they get to appreciate that you can't talk if you can't be side by side. So how do we get bikeways wide enough to be side by side as well as getting them cleaned? So with quick build, we have our constraints because this is quick build, right? It's not a ray, it's not getting a street sweeper to where fit through there or you're making it wide enough in the quick build way is sometimes hard to do. Um, there's other, the, the, the class three facilities or shared facilities you can ride side by side and we can do ways to slow down the vehicles enough that it's actually comfortable to do so. But no, this is this is a, a difficulty in terms of the maintenance of those things. Um, a lot of cities buy a smaller, uh, uh, um, a smaller sweeper or they make agreements with the local businesses or a business district to do cleaning. Um, in downtown, we have the Groundworks crew who does a downtown sweep them until the city purchase um, them. I forgot the chain of the channel, but there's a TikTok channel of a guy who's just riding the street sweeper for protected bike lanes all day. And it's a great channel. He just goes around and be like, what is this in the protected bike lane? Who left this? You know, and then like someone stole a Cadillac. And then he's, he, has a, he, has, he has a screen. He can go down there and grab stuff. It's such a cool little device. And I recommend everybody go check out these little small street sweepers similar to the zambonis you see in like uh not the small ones you see in parking garages a lot of parking building owners have small street sweepers uh, um but yeah those are one of the things that needs to be purchased by the city and city engineers will sometimes be like oh man i can't purchase a street sweeper until i build a street sweeping network you know and okay to build a bikeway network and then we can get a street sweeping network you know for the, the whole city and so we'll get there uh, oh, yeah. cool um, you talked a bit about uh, legal liability, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, everyone, but I believe that Berkeley just indemnified its uh, traffic engineers um, so that they don't have to incur that legal liability. I'm just curious to know whether you think that is, you know, a, a major game changer, and if there are any like unforeseen consequences of that uh, of that move. I, I, that, that scares me a little bit. I'd rather have the engineers work hard to try and figure out how to do things a way that that would with some responsibility the whole point of the pe is to have responsibility on facilities so that, that does scare me a little bit um but uh but i think it, it helps give more freedom in design but like i, I like here in um the, i i remember i was seeing a report on um 90th avenue here in oakland um and it's a great project really i'm, I'm gonna be sp speaking about it tomorrow if you guys come to lunch plenary we're gonna be speaking about that tomorrow um but that was a great project because the children in, the, in east oakland they ride in groups and they ride and to be seen and they ride in the center of the roadway so instead of putting a bike lane on the side that they can get ticketed for why don't we put a facility in the middle where they'll be seen and, and observed um but i have seen during that that news report there was a crash right at the same time as a news report so testing these facilities is great but we still have to have the engineering principles to do so and, and if, and, and if the, you have to value both and i'd say the traffic engineers need to work really well with the artists and the planners to get these facilities working well and you can't take away one just because we want to get stuff done you know what i mean and so i i i i feel for what berkeley's trying to do and, and and but i do think that there is value in 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 the in, the, in, the, in figuring out how to the whole point of engineering is you have objectives and constraints and you're trying to come up with solutions right and if you take away that constraint there's a really it may open up more solutions but i think those constraints are still important um, quick question. Have you worked on a quick build project that successfully took away parking? It took away parking? Yeah. Street every parking? Day. Never. No, every day. Oh, every day? Yeah, I take away parking a lot. Oh, and it works? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay, that's a lot more common than I realized. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of constraints that come with that. In San Jose, we, we work with the businesses on where they can get additional parking. We worked on the bike parking that can be facilitated for there. We try to do a lot of convincing that say, the only people who have wallets in their city aren't people who drive, you know? There's other people who have wallets in their city that are, parking is a wallet delivery system according to the city. It brings money to the city, which I think is silly, right? Transit can bring people to the city. Bicycles can bring people to the city, right? People who don't have to drive have money, right? And so for a city to think that our economy is gonna go away from just parking loss is a very old school way of thinking and there's ways to prioritize things differently. I have a good example of a restaurant in San Jose uh, that was really against the projects we built. And they came out and they brought, came to their entire meeting with their entire family and they were fighting for it. And then they came back and asked for more bike parking after because they were like, people are biking and we want them to come to our business. Can you get bike parking here? And so um, it, 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 culture can change. It just takes time. Parking is really uh, close to people's homes. Another example is I, I was striping the protected bike lane with, people, with the city staff, and this guy came up to me and he pulled his truck right into the protected bike lane, came feet between us, and he was like, "Who put this here?" Right? And all the city staff curled up, and I was like, "Oh, I put this here. Like, let's let's talk about it." And then he ended up saying, "I have a dumpster. My dumpster needs to come out." to get picked up, you didn't plan for my dumpster. I was like, okay, well, what if we narrow this parking spot and put a little bit and get you your dumpster space? And he's like, you can't do that? And I'm like, yeah, we can totally do that. So there's a little bit, they may not be parking exactly, which is irking them, but there may be other things that irk them. And if you work with them on, is it people? Is it you, your delivery? Is it trash pickup? You know, what is it? But there may be different things that irk them than just parking. Um, but it takes a lot of communication uh, for that. It's tough. Um, about parking, another thing is, if you have a protected bike lane on a residential street with 50 foot lots, and you want to protect a bike and protect a bike lane, it's probably not the best idea because you're going to take away everybody's parking. So I repeat, if you have a residential street with small lots, because you need to plan for sight distance, 20 feet on either side of the driveway, you have to take away parking so you can see a protected bike lane. If you have 50 foot lots, you're taking 20 feet from each driveway and you have a driveway which is 20 feet, you're taking away everybody's parking right off the bat. So as much as we love protected bike lanes and we love residential neighborhoods, they don't work well together. Um, so one last thing, the, the two projects in the city of Glendora took away parking. The class four bike facility was diagonal parking originally, and we turned it into parallel parking. And then the parklets was actually, we just removed parking to install the park parklets. But I think going back to what one thing that he mentioned with the communication and the engagement with the community to get them to buy in to the need for the safety improvements. If you don't get the buy-in, then and obviously they're going to um, you know, push back on the project. So having that early on is going to enable you to you know, push that project forward. And also the quick build, it's a, an opportunity to, to test it, right? You know, to see if the parking is really, and get the data to see like, are they really parking? You know, is, is it really a problem? And then if you learned in three months that there is no problem and you haven't received any feedback or negative feedback on it, then you, know, you have your, your, your data to say that the improvements, the safety improvements are more valuable than the parking. Early is key. Um, talking about this projects not as bike lane projects may even be a good idea. Talking about it as quick build projects or uh, parking adjustment projects or some other word may be a better idea because everybody, if they feel it differently, you know, you communicate to, to each, like if you communicate the truck turns and the parking early on, then, then people will understand, the, the people are ready for it. But communication is key to everybody differently. On this slide, I have a few different examples of, of some very interesting success stories. Uh, but you have this is a project I did in downtown, um, with, where, we, where we put in a double white line to legally separate them. So just like you want a fast express lane, which is how I made it here, express lanes work, and I, I have it here on time. But if the double white line you can't cross, and so doing a double white line is key to having protection. If you want to do art in your street, making sure you have the two white bars on either side is the easy way of getting it approved. If you take away those two white bars and you try to colorize a continental crosswalk or a ladder crosswalk. Well, your city engineer might go and quote the MUTCD and said, hey, I need two white bars on either side. But if a white bar and a white bar, effectively you can do whatever you want on the inside and it's still a legal facility. So that's the easy way of getting art, especially if the local cultural art, making sure you have that white bars, maybe making them two feet wide, 
for now, you know, uh, and then doing that is, is, is a key thing. Um, Oakland did a huge uh, effort of paint the town, but it wasn't very well maintained. So if you come around, you'll see that a lot of these ones have been built up and there's dirt and debris in them, and it needs to be repainted, rehired artists, come back out there to go put it back in there, uh, and having continuous engagement, but it can't just be a one-off and then lose contact with that artist. You have to bring them on and have a plan to continue to re-implement that. This was done with the PTA's help. Um, PTA did a lot of uh, uh, organization for uh, um, crossing facilities and more. And I'll show, here I'll show this real quick. So this is a on-street trail we did because it was a trail on one side that dumped people onto a residential street and it picked up people a few blocks away up here in Emeryville on Doyle Street. And what we did is we converted the street into a one-way and took away a few blocks uh, from car traffic. And this is because this road was a major cut through with two arterial streets on either side and the neighborhood didn't like to cut through, but they were scared about the parking loss. And so we convinced them of the parking loss by doing a pilot study for a long, long time and observing it for a few months. And then we went and implemented this on-street trail. Uh, as major connection for the folks. It was built very quickly and now it's a glorified spine of the town. Um, and so these don't have to be bike lane facilities, they don't have to be protected intersections, but about reallocating space for the right type of users that are there. Um, and bikes don't have to stop and cars have to stop as they, as they cross this facility. And so we basically extend the trail throughout. Um, here's a, here's a, some um, images. How, how do you get cars to have to stop and bikes not to have to stop at the same? So along that route, uh -huh. there's no stop. Okay. Across that route, there are Oh, you're, so it's just, it's just, yeah, just cross track. We, we also, in the same way, we put bumps and we put a tight radius. And so they're fairly offset from there. And so they slow down when they cross with that. So there's some sort of vertical uh, feedback. Um, but it, they're so aware. You've seen this huge facility. It's taking off half the street. It's very, very, it's not something that just pops out of nowhere, like a lot of facilities do. And these can come in all shapes and sizes. They can be made one connection. This was a connection between two trails as well in San Rafael. And I wanna show this one, which I think was very cool. This is a crosswalk we did for uh, a tech campus here. Um, it's just one crosswalk, but this, the tech campus said that we need a crosswalk and we need it now, right? Which we've all heard <laughs> before, but they got it done in three weeks, four weeks with, with our help, right? Um, where they said we want it because our buildings cross and how could they do it? And the cities can, the volunteer organizations can, because we work with every single person about what their issues were. The city quickly said, hey, we need to do a lighting study because there's no lighting on that project. And we weren't gonna do a lighting study because it takes too much time. So we found this really cool unit. I'm really proud of us finding this unit. It's made by TAPCO. When you press the push button, it shines a beacon down on the crosswalk and illuminates the entire crosswalk. The area up and down the crosswalk and the area where someone's sitting and it speaks to you in English and Spanish. And it's a great unit. And, and that way we were able to implement the crosswalk with quickly within three weeks, we just paint and post. Um, and just talking to each person of what their issues are and not taking that as an as oh lighting study let me put let me give you a scope and fee for that and instead of doing that being like hey this is how we can solve it is a very different consultant approach that most consultants don't do most ones will be like lighting study let's go more study right but no at, at the end of the day i want to get a crosswalk done we have to deliver for our client which is a tech campus and they needed to get something done and the same type of push can be done with advocacy agencies with cbo's you know it doesn't have to go through this long winded route I have a quick question. Um, you said signs don't work, but do l flashing lights on signs and lights work with signs? Yes, okay. yes. Lights, lights work really well. Really well. Um, we have a few different types of lights. This is an RRFB. When you press it, it shines flashy yellow lights at you. It's warning you. Um, there's another one, which is a hawk signal, which is more expensive, where it shines red lights until you stop. But the flashy lights do help a lot. Um, if the flashy light's on all the time, it doesn't help. Okay, It's got to be turned off and it'll be on at the at the, at, the, at the right time. Um, and and uh, yeah, so we, that, those are some of the materials that we use. Um, we're here for answering any questions um, to you all. Thank you all for coming here. And, and, uh, we, we will take questions. Um, I do, I don't know how many uh, QuickBook guideline books we have over there, but Cal Bike and Alta put together the Quick Build guidelines. So we brought a few booklets over there that goes through the whole planning process, design, and um, maintenance of Quick Build facilities. 
I have a question. Whoa. I have a question from Mr. Barricade. 1.5 million followers. Well done. You're probably the most well-known urban planner ever. <laughs> I'm going to say he just arrived and I had a selfie with him. So, and I sent it to my son who's studying urban planning. He said, I'm cool, so thank you. <laughs> my question for Mr. Barricade is, what did you learn by uh, becoming a star? What did you learn from your audience? What are the takeaways? What are the best way we have to talk to people who simply don't know or don't understand or are not even aware of urban planning? Thank you. Um, one of the first things that I learned on social media is not everybody's interacted with Indian people before. Okay? And so that was, <laughs> that was a big lesson because I grew up here was very diverse and suddenly I went on social media and all the middle school bullying came out. And so I learned that the hard way. Um, and then after I learned that, after I went through that, what I learned is a lot of people find different things that, that irk them. And it helped me when I read through the comments, understand what issues are and it helps me learn how to explain things better to folks and it's, I, I find it's a very valuable tool to me because whatever I do people dissect on social media they take it apart they say whatever they want to say and uh, um, and it helps me also grow a thicker skin and also learn how to explain different things um, another thing is I feel very blessed to be in the Bay Area where we've been innovating in this space for a while I've been innovating in this space for a while and a lot of cities have not seen this before and so being able to show that has really been really rewarding for me um, and in, a, in, a, in addition to that it's just seeing all the Seeing, I, in the TikTok, there's a duets that come up. If people can respond to your video and stuff like that. And I remember this one stitch that this guy did, or this video that this guy made, and he tagged me. Um, my video, my account got banned for a short amount of time because I had too many car-centric people and too many people who never met Indian people before. And I had so many reports that it, my account got removed. Um, and then I had to go fight and talk to TikTok to go get it back. But during that time, I remember these videos, people who were making videos being like, bring Mr. Barricade back. And one really struck out to me of this trucker. And he's in his truck and he's like, where did Mr. Barricade go? I used to hate bicycle facilities, but now I learned we need to create space for our feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need it. Where is he? And so there's a lot of people who, who have not been exposed to this that are from community. We're all products of our built environment. I'm a product of the, of the Bay Area, uh, Silicon Valley Bay Area. And I, I'd say that um, learning all the different perspectives has been very, very valuable to me. And it's going to be a process that I continue to grow with. My, my question is about uh, bike ladders, if you can speak about those. Crosswalks give pedestrians at every intersection in California the right of way, if I'm not mistaken, as long as they don't dart out into the intersection. Um, and a bicyclist, if they get off their bike, they can use that privilege anytime they want. But if you're on your bike, you some cities say, have different laws about them. But what about these green crosswalk ladders? How I, It seems like that could be a really amazing tool, um, especially if bikes could elevate slightly above cars in terms of right of way, still below pedestrians. Um, hopefully, our legislate, you know, we can legislate that. Can you talk? ladders and, and and whether they're sure. helpful or not yeah so we do these dash uh dash points and in conflict conflict markings. conflict markings it's it's because that's where the interaction is going to be shared right no, no, i'm saying when it's no. a crosswalk and then they paint a green line mm -hmm. with right yeah, so when, when we have these dashed lines, it's where they're going to be shared. So most bike lanes, it gets shared before the intersection because cars are getting into the bike lane to make a right turn. And putting it through the intersections, a lot of engineers would argue against that because the conflict actually happened before the intersection because the car got into the, into the bike lane. In a protected bike lane, in a protected bike lane, if you took that conflict and put it into the intersection. So that's where we do these dashed green through the intersection that's similar to a crosswalk. Because the conflict is not before the intersection, it's now in the intersection. I think I'm using the wrong word then, because the, what I'm talking about is where the crosswalk itself is half -free. Yes, yes. So because a pedestrian is on a sidewalk and when a car turns, they can interact with the pedestrian after the turn. That's where the conflict is. In a protected bike lane, the interaction happens the same way because they're protected up until the intersection and then they cross. So engineers would, would want to do that crossing when you have a protected facility because that's where the conflict is. But they don't necessarily like to do that when in a bike lane 
because the conflict was before the intersection. I don't agree with that, but that's what a lot of cities do. The, the reason you see it's shorter, like a crosswalk, is because when they interact with it and they cross it per perpendicularly, it looks like dots, right? When you look over a merge, if you see the dashed line, we call that a 39A, but you see that dashed line of the of before the intersection, when you look at it from this angle and you're weaving, it looks like dots. You get me, right? Like when you look at it from the side, it gets, those dash bike lanes are actually blank eight foot, solid four foot, blank eight foot. They're huge. When you look at them up straight, it's a huge four foot block. But when you look at it from a vehicle, it's dots. Similar to how when you look at a crosswalk from a sideways, it comes as dots. So, so, so an engineer would 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 do that shorter ladder crossing for bikes when it's a protected facility because that's where the conflict. Um, and we need more of them. Um, we call them cross bikes, if you want to call them. Like a crosswalk, you have a cross bike. That's why I'm cross road lap, you know, that's the name of the firm. And so, um, but cross bikes are very, very important. Um, we, we, we need more of them. Um, but for an engineer, they would argue against that because the conflict happened before the intersection in the bike lane. Um, but I'm, I, I always think, sorry, I always talk about how different people would argue against things because I'm so used to that. So I'm, I'm used to like being able to say, oh, you, this is how you usually do with this and this is how we're going to do it in the future. Anything you want to add about, about conflict markets? No, I was just going to say that they are recommended and we do recommend them a lot more. We've got one, two, three, four. Hey, first off, I want to say thank you for the TikTok videos. They're really handy to share to explain things to people. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Love them. Um, <laughs> and second, I wanted to ask about what kind of options exist for green infrastructure quick builds. Can you talk about these being, they can be six months to five year projects, and then even maybe having those just be repeated going forward for, you know, indefinitely. What can be integrated, like rain gardens, or do you have any suggestions or where I can find more information? So to be honest, rain gardens are hard to be in quick build. I, I would say they're more of a capital improvement project because they mess with impervious area. Okay, impervious area is very critical for engineers. It's it's pavement that the water does not pass through, and water used to go into the soil naturally, and now it has pavement. And so when you do a swale, the reason you do a swale is because you're adding more impervious area. You have to filter 30% of the water into a swale. So that's more of a capital improvement project um, than quick build. Though, in right now, there's a lot of money in sustainability. Sustainability is a new division, and it's separate from your, if you look at an org chart of a city, it's public works, the DOT, other folks, and the sustainability is a separate group. And they have more money than everybody else. So there's a lot of projects that can be piggybacked on bike lane projects that have swale projects. What about some of those, ra like maybe not necessarily swales, but you know, raised planters just to get it started and get trees in there? Or, I mean, have you found anything? Have you tried any of these or seen any successful projects like this that are quick build? They do have Zikla planters that you can use as like buffers within your, your class four bike facility. So that could be a part of getting some of that green infrastructure on site as a quick build project. Um, but it, will, it would need to be turned into a permanent project at some point, but they do have the large planters that you can add that green infrastructure to your project. There's, there's a bunch of different types of planters we can use, but there's a key thing that you have to do with planters. In Oakland on Telegraph Avenue, they had some planters. Did anybody remember what happened to those? They got moved by somebody. Somebody moved it with their truck across the street and it ended up blocking a funeral home on the first day and the mayor got involved and it became this huge thing because the planters got moved. So you need to lock them down somehow. You need to have make sure you have uh, maintenance on them so they become trash bins eventually. So you gotta make sure that somebody, the city knows to go remove them and stuff for that. And watering them is also a key thing. So there's, oh, there's some planters that can be watered themselves. They have a reservoir in it that you can refill and it stays in there. There's ways of taking a bottle and putting it upside down in the planter and going out there and um, replacing that. There's different agreements that can be made with local community that the community goes and replaces that. And so you can do an agree agreement with them. Um, I worked on a few uh, traffic circles where the, this, this, the community is going and watering them and maintaining them and putting in what they want. And there's an agreement with the city that they won't go too crazy for what they want to do. But there's different levels of, of doing that. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Thanks for talking about different types of separation, like planters. And so I'm seeing in a lot of your projects, a lot of plastic posts um, and a lot of class four bikeways that we see are using plastic posts. And what I'm hearing a lot from communities is, I don't 
want those plastic posts. Those look terrible yeah. and they're gonna get knocked down and I don't really believe that you're gonna maintain them. Um, I have an aesthetic concern. Are you hearing that? Um, how are you dealing with that? Um, and are you looking at other products? Yes, yes. So the product you see in a lot of our pictures and videos is a K71 post. It's called a K71. It's a big, tall, thick one that looks like a big candlestick. The reason we like using that is because it folds flat. It fully flat. So the fire truck can go over that emergency and it folds flat and it comes back up. We also don't like it because it folds flat. So in a low, uh, if there's a runaway vehicle, they could run over that or distract a driver. But to a driver at night, it looks beefy, beefy. And every Uber I've been to, they're like, what? That thing's made out of plastic? Like they don't, they don't realize it looks like something that's, that's beefy that they don't want to hit. Um, but then they realize it's a plastic thing. So there's, they're like, okay, that's a good idea. But the case in one post is the one post that we, we use a lot. There's a new post on the block called the case of me too, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the case of me too is I, I saw it first in LA and we, we put a few of them in Emeryville but it looks like a pawn piece and so it's a little bit more ornate and it can, it's a little bit of a thicker plastic than the other ones but it still also does fold flat um, but the reason we make them fold flat is because of emergency access and other things that we need from the fire department um, the fire department what we don't what a lot of people don't realize the fire department is why we have the curbs that, that they are like that's because of the fire a lot of fire departments their, their um, budgets are based on response time and so when you they say hey you're putting all this stuff in the street we're like our response time is going to go down and then you'd be like oh we'll give you a signal priority i'm like oh, okay you know right and okay so there's like different ways of talking to 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 them um fire trucks need 20 feet and they need 26 and they're taller buildings more than 35 because their ladders need to access them so you tell them hey your ladder needs to access them so you actually don't want to be right next to the curb because of the ladder be like oh yeah that is our standard you know and like you know they'll, they'll backtrack a little bit but there's ways of talking about looking through the standards and be like hey this is how you actually operate you being closer further away from this building so you can angle is actually smarter for you than being right next to the curb and then the, but you have to go through the standards and understand what their priorities are um armadillos, armadillos are, are great but the city needs to know and read how to install them san jose installed all of them at 45 degrees which is not what you're supposed to do they have different angles depending on the speed of the of the road so the vehicles don't when they hit it they can bounce back and so um they're great products but the fire truck doesn't like them very much i'm working on a project right now where we're building a two-way facility that's wide enough for a fire truck to go through um, and the armadillos are being used um, in, in San Jose we use the armadillos for to hold the dumpsters up from rolling down into the gutter uh, so we use them up there um, but it's a good product uh, it, 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 but there is a um, there's, there's pros and cons um, we used the armadillos on an Ojai project, uh, which was a Caltrans facility, State Route 150 and State Route, well, actually it was State Route 33. Um, and they work, they work well. The, the Zekla products are great. Um, I, I, I want to wait till they start manufacturing them here in the US though, because they are come from Spain, they come from recycled plastic from Spain and we want to use our recycled plastic. Uh, and then, so, so I, I, lo I love the products, they're great, but I think there's, 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 there's we, we'd love for them to manufacture here in the, in the States. One, sorry, one uh, one question from the virtual audience. Um, so Taylor uh, was interested and curious about um, the money coming just um, by cars, the false claim, and your story about the restaurant owners, and wanted to check in if, if it's being checked that um, uh, connecting business owners and local business orgs uh, that are opposing projects with the peers in uh, communities and other uh, um, uh, cities where this has worked out. Um, is this a thing that you are uh, also doing? We, to, clar to clarify your question, you're asking if that's, if that's a continuous process that we do with, with businesses. So, so if you're going to plan a project where you're going to take away uh, probably a few parking spots, and then you're going to, um, you need to um, convince the opposition about that, that um, loss of parking space. Um, Taylor was uh, interested and curious if it would be possible to connect those business owners with successful projects in other um, cities to learn from them because they went through the same transformation. I, I, I'm a little nervous with that because that's not their role, right? That's a, their role is their, it's their business. So I think talking to them on their level is important about what the issues are there locally. Sometimes if you show them a picture from Seattle or some other town, it might just go over their head and be like, this is not ours, my, my city. And you have to be careful about 
political thing, but going in there and listening, why do they care about the parking? Is it because they need their beer truck to come in every day? Is it because they're scared their customers are not gonna be able to park short term? Is it because their, their dumpster needs to get picked up? Is it because they have an event? Maybe you say, hey, we'll give you a parklet, or this is actually your space, or they, you have a space to have dining or something like that. But talking to them on their level is really key when you talk to local citizens. We can talk that way with ideas of different cities and success stories to the city staff. But when talking to local citizens, that sometimes, in my experience, has actually angered them more, you know, um, because they're just like, that's not gonna work in my town. And that's the NIMBY mentality, right? And so like, we, 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 we gotta be careful about how we, 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 don't, uh, we don't do stuff that can detract from the, our goals. Yeah, um, real quick one about the flex posts. So I live very near the upper telegraph uh, project in the tennis call. Really love the project, but what I hear from all of my neighbors is that the visual distraction, uh, especially because the, they, the, the, they have the white posts there, that um, especially at night, people are very disoriented by all of that reflective stuff all over, it's like a forest, and they don't know how to then translate mm -hmm. that into what am I supposed to do? So is there well, sure. No, no, no. And people have slowed down, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's generally working, I would say. Um, but that's what I, I, and I perceived that myself when I heard yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, it made sense to me. So is it is it the spacing or is it just living with it for the quick build, quick build interim? It's the spacing. It's the spacing of that design. If I can be, is anybody from the city of Oakland here? Um, but, it, we, hello. Um, but that design, they, they, there's so much parking there and there's so much difference consistency that when you look down the street, it's not a continuous line of posts. That's how it is in traffic control. When you look down the street of a construction site, you see a continuous line of posts. That's not what's happening on Telegraph Avenue. So it's certain locations that may be more frequent posts. Replacing the posts frequently is key to have that visual thing. If you go down the roads and see Jose, there's frequent posts and you look down the street, it looks like a wall of light and you can see where those conflict points are and you know to prepare for those conflict points and the city's continuously maintaining those things. Um, another issue that I see a lot is cities are tightening it for a smaller truck too often. You know, there's big trucks out there and they're gonna run over your post. And what happened with Telegraph Avenue is they ran over it first day, you know? And so planning for the larger trucks, I inherit a lot of projects from other consultants. I, a lot of projects from other consultants that don't get delivered, I inherit. So from all my comp competitors. And all of them, I see them use tiny trucks and push it to the max because they're coming from the planning realm into the engineering realm. And for me, I would say, let me plan for the largest truck and still make it safe, you know? And that way I plan for both. And that's because I come from the highway realm, you know? And I talk to my engineers there and they'd be like, yeah, we, we work with planners, that's what they want. I'm kind of stuck. But no, we have to plan for the worst case scenario, you know? And it's really, really critical. And, and, and if the it, 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 and uh, trucks can do well, they truck whisperers, you know, they can go around big turns and do all kinds of stuff because that's their job. They're not trying to damage their truck, right? And so I, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of credit we can give them and a lot of planning uh, can be done to, to this together. So, so I know we're, we're in the thick of it and it's like really getting good. Um, but I was told to inform everyone that uh, 1740 the rooftop happy hour is happening soon so uh, i guess make your way to the rooftop happy hour um but uh vignesh and i are still here and i know ari had a question so um Thanks. Uh, amazing presentation, by the way. Um, my question is about, you mentioned how city staff have different way of organizing and relationship with the consultants. You had like three different methods. Um, is it, how is the best way for us to help city staff get to the optimal um, set, setup? I forgot what, what the name was. It was uh, integrated project delivery. Yeah. I'm opinionated about things, if you haven't noticed, um, but I say uh, augmented staff is a really good way. Sorry. Augmented staff. Uh -huh. So a city per person can hire a consultant as a staff member uh -huh. and have them run the show and boost everybody up. You need a local champion. You need somebody who's going to take that heat. And putting it on a planner is unfair because PE has a li liability, right? So I see a lot of planners running around trying to get bicycle facilities and they're not able to speak up, up against the engineers. And so having an engineer there who's ready to take it on is key. And as a consultant, you can you take that liability on. Um, so I say that's one of the secret strategies of getting a lot done in the city. Uh, the 
main thing that's missing in cities that I feel is that there isn't standard details for this stuff at all. And I repeat, there is not standard details adopted yet. If the city can adopt standard details about how to deal with a protected bike lane, how to deal with the right current conflict, how to deal with the cross bike, then it becomes normalized as a standard practice. But if it's just something else that happened in some other city and this is always experimenting and always pilot and always testing, it's not gonna do what we're trying to do. So adopting standard details should be one of the first things. And I get so angry when I look at master plans and they don't have anything about the detail. We can copy a detail from a different city and have details in there, but there's too many, too many of them that are just that, that, that push that detailing to an actual project. And if you have that only on an actual project, we only have those details on that project. It's not something that's incorporating the whole city. So. <clears throat> I have a question for you. Um, um, in your presentation, there was an image with uh, the K71s on both sides of the bike lane, the left side between the vehicles, and then on the right side as well. I was wondering why that was. Was it, I think, so that may have been in the, um, in the location uh, as you approach the parking because we had parallel park we, we turned the diagonal parking to parallel parking I, I think that's the one the city of glendora image um, i don't know it, it, it needs to be the parking and it, it looks like a little mirror but maybe that was it i have not understood the I saw, I, it's a, I saw the image as well. That, right there, that was that, that space. So this is the city of LA. This wasn't my design, but uh, uh, it's just in front of our building. Our building's right here. Um, but uh, this used to be, uh, I would say, a parking lane, um, but it's red curb there. Uh, it seems like something more to maintain yeah. that. I don't know what that's for. But I do know that the new project is going to push this over and they're going to have a concrete median here for the entire stretch of this 1.5 mile corridor. So this was. I have put posts on both sides when I have a right turn pocket there. So there's been a few times when we have a right turn pocket to the side of this. And I've done posts like this uh, with a bike box a few times to accommodate the left turn and one for the right turn. There's a heavy right turn there. Um, but that's, but I'm not sure what this, this one is, is trying to do. Last question, maybe. Yeah, she, she goes. She, she goes first. Yeah, I'm hugging the mic too much. So. <laughs> this backpedaling uh, to when you said, mentioned about engineers resolving themselves of. Uh, liability with signs. So I was just uh, curious, uh, why is it when um, if, in a situation where, okay, if there's just uh, one safety uh, infraction once in a while, that's, that's okay. But when that happens multiple times, uh, why is it uh, always just always uh, so put on the user to be responsible? There's no, there's no what? When multiple safety infractions occur at the same place, why is the, why is the responsibility so put on or blamed on the users? It shouldn't be. It should, yeah. it should, it should be that they, if it's happening in the same place frequently, yeah. it should be looked at that we should go do an additional design there. And the design there should not just be putting up a sign saying that warning or something like that. It should be actually working on some sort of design. Um, but the city engineers can't get away with putting up a sign saying it's up to the user, but I fundamentally disagree with that, uh, that perspective. I think we should be out. Con continuous project delivery is looking at where the locations are and working on those intersections. San Jose is where I'm from, and they we worked on this huge project for them, and they have not continue to protect the intersection delivery after that project. And now San Jose has very, very high fatality rate on many of these facilities that would have wanted protected intersections. And so City of Fremont, on the other hand, has implemented protected intersections even where there isn't a lot of bicycle facilities and they've had no crashes and no fatalities. So there's a stark difference in how cities approach different things. And I'd say it's really important to keep city staff on it and integrated project delivery instead of just waiting for, oh, let's wait for a full master plan to study all the fatalities 
communities, to eventually put thick lines on paper, to eventually apply for grants for those thick lines, to eventually, like, no, you know, we gotta, we gotta start having ongoing project delivery. All right, so this is the last question, and, and we're done. Happy hours, call link, our names, rooftop, 1740, last question. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's a question or a rant, but it feels to me that, pun intended here, uh, we are reinventing the wheel. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Not Just Back, a YouTube channel that's fantastic. I recommend it. I'm a big patron. And over there, it seems like they figured out a lot lot of stuff that we're trying to figure out here as well, but they did it 30 to 40 years ago. Would it be simpler to simply either invite them or go over there and learn from what they did and their mistakes instead of reinventing the wheel again? Um, do, Vince, do you want to go ahead? Well, so we, we've, been, we've been talking about protecting intersections as a part of their core design, and eye contact is part of their core design, and making users interact with each other and have human interaction is a key element of their design and they went through a major fatality uh, time when children wanted to play in the street and they weren't able to play in the street and so they advocated to go have safer streets for people and they went through a phase like that um, in the US we're starting to do that and we are not trying to reinvent the wheel we're using a lot of their best practices the evolution of the protected bikeway guide that Alta put together brought together a lot of the best practices and and, and all these things are, are working towards the same type of facilities that they have out there um, but to be honest we there's been with Ashto, they've been waiting for five, six years and it still hasn't been approved the new design guidelines. So we are still trying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.